Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the business committee meeting of October the 13th. Open. I'll just start off by uh, saying it's with great respect and humility. We acknowledge and honor the lands of the Sinema people. The Sinema people maintain their profound, unique and spiritual connection to the land through ageless traditions, teachings, stewardship and expressions of reciprocity. Are there any additions, deletions or changes in order to the agenda? And just as a reminder to please use the chat. Seeing none, can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Moved by Trustee McKay. Seconded by Trustee Stanley. Is there anyone in uh, opposition or opposed to the motion? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, item six on the agenda, the minutes of the business committee meeting held September 15th, 2021. Uh, there's a recommended motion included on the agenda. Does someone want to move the motion? Moved by Trustee O'Neill. Seconded by Trustee Berzovic. Is there anyone opposed to the motion? Seeing none, the motion carries. We have uh, no presentations this evening, so we'll move on to item number 8.1, administrative procedure, uh, a new administrative procedure on naming uh, and uh, permanent recognition. And I'll pass it over to Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, and apologies if I've been all choppy. Just interrupt me. We're here in Vancouver. I think the uh, Wi-Fi should be good, but it's not. I have to come out and get back on. Uh, the first evening uh, is an associated with recognition that stems from the naming policy, but that's slightly different. And so what it does is it does two things. The first one, uh, in response to a number of questions uh, and concerns raised during the feedback uh, when the board passed policy 2.19, the naming of facilities, uh, one of the questions that was raised is, well, what about immersion schools? Uh, and so what we've done in the AP is address that concern. So the idea that a school could be named a coal in the case of a French school, uh, or if a school was in immersion schools in another language, it could certainly be named uh, the, the name for school without needing to go through the policy of 2.19. However, uh, it also clarifies that in the event that the school has a, uh, a, a geographic example, so Bayview, for instance, we wouldn't rename it the French version of Bayview uh, or Hammond Bay in the same reason. It would be a Cole Hammond Bay. So just for clarity there. And the second one is uh, we do receive on occasion requests for memorial plaques, memorial cairns, uh, memorial trees or uh, trees and plaques, etc. in honor of individuals. Uh, th what this AP actually does is bring clarity to say that we actually will not uh, proceed on that basis. Uh, so in some in some cases you, you you'll see you know benches on on city property that might be in honor of of someone that's passed etc uh, rather than put the district in the position of number one an overwhelming request for those types of uh, memorials uh, the potential of having to maintain them as well as the potential of having to determine if the individuals appropriate is on our property we would just um, actually do continue or not model uh, future requests that obviously the district or the board for naming facilities or parts of facilities it would also not prevent uh, let's use an example of at Chase River there's uh, um, an information uh, uh, plaque or not information plaque but information billboard put up by the city that provides some of the history of the area that would be viewed as slightly different in addition if um, uh, one of our uh, rights holders Stonemo or Stonalis or Staminas came to us with a similar request we may well uh, look at that uh, so just wanted to provide the public clarity because we do get some questions and certainly we understand that it's been 
uh, perhaps not consistently practiced um, out there. Some schools would say, oh great, that's an interesting idea. Uh, we will support that. Uh, this would centralize it and uh, put a limit on its use. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Um, so you did break up a little bit there. I'm hoping uh, I did get what I needed to. So um, what maybe what we'll do is we, if, if it goes on and it gets too bad, we'll ask you to turn your camera off and we'll give that a try. But I think uh, I got everything I needed to get out of there. So um, hopefully everybody else did. And we do have in the agenda on page eight an information sheet that contains all the information. And I'll just uh, ask uh, trustees and stakeholders in the meeting if uh, there are any questions for uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Seeing none, I'll thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh, for your report and your presentation. So moving on to item 8.2, Administrative Procedure Transportation. Again, back to Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so again, you'll see a, rel a fairly uh, robust memo outlining or information sheet outlining uh, the issue. Uh, and the issue is associated with uh, changes uh, directed by the board uh, to our transportation policy in response to ensure that we have community feedback. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Sabo. Uh, but just prior to um, turning it over, um, one of the concerns when this issue was initially raised was the idea that if staff were uh, proceeding to examine the discontinuation of a route, that the public is somewhat surprised in the sense that it comes to this meeting first. This policy or the change to the AP does not solve that. It, what it does, however, is give a process that means that the board, this committee likely, would see the report with the recommendation assessed by which we consult, then come back again to the board for final determination. So uh, again, the public will have an opportunity to uh, have a comment, but prior to staff contemplating such a, a, a removal of a route, the board is always our first stop. So with that, I turn it over to Mr. Sabo and I'll turn my camera off. Good evening. Thanks, uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Um, uh, I think the Secretary Treasurer has indicated the significant change to the AP as outlined on uh, uh, Appendix D. Uh, other minor changes were made to the AP and um, I don't think they need very much explanation, but staff are available to answer any questions that uh, that may be uh, required. Um, I did want to take a moment and introduce our uh, new uh, transportation manager, Tracy Mowat, and thank her for her work on the AP and uh, her efforts in the transportation department. Learning a new new department is a is a, a steep learning curve. So uh, Tracy, perhaps you can um, show your face and say hi to people for a second. Oh, I think I need to. There we are. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today and uh, look forward to uh, listening in. Thank you, Chair. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Um, so are there any trustees who uh, have any questions for staff on this item? Trustee Stanley. Hi, um, I guess I get to be kind of the first to say welcome because there's comments. Tracy, hi, but um, hi. I get to say it, so I'm special. Um, so I don't know if this is, I mean, it's kind of a question, kind of a comment. Um, I, I want to tell you my process of reading the uh, AP on this. Um, just because it, the title was transportation and it starts off with saying the values of the board and active transportation and and how it's important for staff and students and I got a little excited and then I read the the AP and it was you know I know we discussed these changes and so it's it, it's not that there's anything wrong it's just that I got my hopes up frankly about a little bit more about active transportation and um about not just for students. So I think um, I was hoping that we were had addressed or we were going to address um, 
in this an AP 426, which is about, you know, staff transportation. Um, so, you know, related, but not the same thing. And the AP 426, I mean, I guess we'll try to address this at a later point in time. It's, it's, it's not consistent with our strategic plan and it's inaccurate. And so I think that that's one thing that we need to, you know, be aware of that needs to be addressed. But I, what I, you know, my disappointment, I will own, um, it, it's more like, I just want to say, I think the title needs to be clarified because this really is about student transportation. And, um, and, and it might be minor and maybe I just got my hopes up and maybe that's just me. But um, I, I think that when we, really start digging into active transportation and the environmental aspects of you know encouraging people to go to work school um via active transportation modes that we're going to be digging into this and other ap's a little bit more maybe um you know at a later point in time and so maybe we just need to clarify the title on this one as you know students and um and that that might just uh you know kind of correctly orient the reader a little bit more um so uh i have no real you know i there i have no necessarily concerns about this per se because it does what you know we needed to do and thank you for the work on that um but um yeah, I guess I just got a little I guess I, I went down a garden path. Um so just want to share that maybe 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 the title could be a little bit more specific to the topic of the AP, um, and that maybe later on we can figure out how best to address the um, <clears throat> the other two issues that I mentioned. So not not really a question, just kind of wanted to share that process a little bit. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Stanley. Um, perhaps uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh, is there any? Do you have a response to the other AP that Trustee Stanley was referring to? Is that something that is on the list? And sorry, well, I don't have the through, number. Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I think, well, I think um, what what we'd be looking at is uh, two committees, uh, or well, I should say three committees that are all going to be potentially addressing the issue raised in. in so we've got the policy committee that's maybe looking for take policy uh, and then changes may well stem from that. And when the board changes policy, we go back to our APs to make sure. The environmental committee, uh, so environmental sustainability committee that's just coming online uh, and that one of the goals I believe. We've uh, be reviewing policies. I expect that that oh, am I freezing? Yeah, so sorry, Secretary okay. Treasurer Walsh. Could I ask perhaps Mr. Sabo and um, sorry, the I forgot your last name, <laughs> our new Ooh. transportation manager, um, to please turn the cameras off and see if that helps Mr. Walsh's uh, signal at all. Apologies. I did pay for the expensive hotel internet and everything for this meeting. Um, am, am I coming through? You're good now. Thank you. So, so the policy committee may well make changes to the policy, which would then have us change the AP. In addition, the environmental committee, sustainability committee, is about to come online and may also take the opportunity to suggest changes or a new AP to address exactly that. So this was in response to a direction from the board, but that doesn't stop us from doing exactly what the what Trustee Stanley has suggested um, even this year. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Um, do you are you looking for a follow up, Trustee Stanley? See so you pop back up on the screen. No, just thank you for the clarity on on that related but separate aspect. Thanks. Great, thank you. And, and I will bring uh, my comments next, I suppose, just uh, thank, to thank uh, staff for this work, because I know that I was one of the trustees who brought this issue forward, and I'm glad to see that there's a, a process outlined in the AP. So thanks again. OK, so moving on to item 8.3, Administrative Procedure for School Site Acquisition. Back to you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and hopefully it does actually come back to me. <laughs> um, so on page 29 of the agenda, there is a brief memo that outlines the reasoning for the AP. Uh, so uh, what we're to align the AP to come out at the same time as the school site acquisition charge. And what this will do is hopefully respond to concerns that are raised to our various municipal and regional partners by developers about potentially an open ended SSAC. So what that means is that this AP means we must review every five years. In addition, it outlines the process by which an SSAC is put into place. And what this does is it separates school site acquisition from disposition uh, and and build. Market. So very okay. specific AP to be particularly the development community. OK. Thank you, Mark. Um, you were breaking up a little bit at the end, but uh, hopefully we got uh, most of that. Um, I wonder if you could perhaps try without your video on and maybe that might help us a little bit. I will do so. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Um, so did you have anything additional to, to add to item 8.3? I, I think the end may have got cut off for some of us. Uh, just again, the commitment to transparency when we are instituting an SSAC uh, and uh, to make sure that our we are able to show our municipal and regional partners uh, the process that will follow. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Walsh on this item? Seeing, oh, sorry, uh, just about missed you there, Trustee Stanley. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, so I, I'm uh, enthusiastically in full support of this. Um, I, I just think it makes sense as far as, um, you know, uh, well, I mean, it's in legislation as well, but community support, you know, when we develop and, and increase uh, in, in our population that we need to ensure that we have space for our schools. Um, and, and so I guess when I was reading this, I was surprised by the, I think what you refer to about uh, it being open-ended or closed-ended. Um, and I, I'm, I'm curious about why we wouldn't want it to be uh, ongoing so that there's always um, a, a, a school site acquisition charge rather than something that is kind of reviewed every five years and, and, and dependent upon um, it. it, it, it I, <sighs> Yeah, why wouldn't we? Because I thought I, my assumption was that it would be more fair if it was spread out evenly. Um, so perhaps I could just get a, you know, why is it that we had that? Uh, I don't know what the alternative is to say, closed ended. Um, sure. Perhaps I can explain why we've got it that way. Sure. So in order to successfully implement a school site acquisition charge, we're obligated to show that we actually have a need. Um, so we have we need to show here's how many seats we have today and how many students we have today. Here's how many seats. Here's how many students we'll have in 10 years. And if we have enough seats for those students, even if we're getting more, we don't need a school site acquisition charge or potentially we do if the neighborhood is far away. It's a new neighborhood. So in five years time, if we expand five schools and we build 700 new seats, then theoretically the new land that we need, the, the growth that we've predicted to come, will have addressed all of the need for capacity. And so then we would redo our numbers and then the numbers in five years, if they say 10 years later, we're actually going to decline in enrollment or alternatively we're not going to need any more spaces because we're static then th there'd be no need to collect the funds on the growth and i think the idea is is that the thousand dollars a door to approximately that we would be collecting is somewhat of an inhibitor on development and so if we're not developing we have enough seats for our kids we don't predict more kids are going to happen, then 
there's no need to collect the additional dollars. Do you require a follow up, Trustee Stanley? Um, allow me to ask a clarifying question. Um, I, I guess what I am can perhaps confused about is, is if this is dependent and directly related to development, um, then, you know, and let's say it slows down, um, but yet it's still, you know, it, it slows down. And so we think that we're OK for the next five years, but it's a continuous pace. Um, if we're not continuously collecting a school site acquisition charge, are we going to find ourselves in a situation of having to play catch up because um, although development was slow, it was continuous and built up to a point where there was significant need. So I, I guess that's that's kind of like I'm, why, why I'm wondering why it wouldn't be continuous. So through you, Mr. Chair, so we anticipate based off of what we can see from growth patterns that it indeed will be continuous, but the the site acquisition is a, is two things happening at the same time. It's development is happening and the development is producing kids and and so if the development's happening and producing kids. Um, then but we've got spaces for them, then they shouldn't need to pay because we don't need more spaces. The other example is developments happening. It's not actually producing enough kids, and so therefore we've got spaces for the kids that would be produced by it. It's really for additional kids created by development that's new is the idea. So for instance, um, you know, we're, I'm sitting in Vancouver right now, and they've probably put hundreds of thousands of units in Vancouver, but it's not necessarily the type of unit that's creating kids everywhere. And so maybe they wouldn't have needed, they've got enough seats to provide. I, I'm just giving an example. But if Nanaimo all of a sudden is in a downtown, creates, you know, 1,000 micro units, they're not going to produce any kids in those micro units that need schools or very few. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. And I, I have a question, so I'm next on the list. Uh, I wonder if you could clarify a little bit about um, accepting or providing land in lieu of a school site acquisition charge and what considerations go into that so that we ensure that land is, uh, is being offered that's acceptable in terms of its location, its size, its connectivity, um, and all the rest of it. I just wanted to know uh, what goes into that and how the AP would provide guidance for to that. Sure, thank you for the question. So uh, I think the the all the points that you just made or what the considerations would be if that came about. And so let's take um, sandstone as an example. Here's a very, very large singular development. They know theoretically at least and they know what direction and where the houses are going to go. And so rather than having to have a school like an acquisition charge on each site, they've got this parcel of land that's able to provide us to that's a, that's a site built in. We have a look, we determine geotechnically it's good. We determine that it's sufficient land site. We just determine that we it's in a good spot geographically for the anticipated growth. Then we would say, great, yes, we can accept that in lieu, but we would have to make that de that determination. What I will say for the land um, in lieu generally is it is preferable because particularly in the short term, the likelihood that we're going to have enough school site acquisition dollars to actually acquire a site versus a land in lieu kind of situation where we might have a developer that actually has an interest in having a school to support that development generally, we may end up actually getting kind of more bang for our buck if we went that direction. But if if we were offered land that was in the wrong spot, we didn't want to build because we say we wanted to expand instead, um, then we wouldn't necessarily consider that. Thank you. And if I may just ask a quick follow up. Um, so all the for all the reasons that you mentioned, um, you know, speaking in general terms, is there a reason why we wouldn't want that in the AP? to provide some consistency and direction? 
excuse me for the can I just confirm you mean for for what considerations are required to to determine land and uh, land in lieu offer? Yeah, so for example, I believe uh, you had mentioned things like, you know, it's geotechnically uh, suitable, it's uh, in the right location, you know, meets the needs educationally is, I don't know, whatever it was that staff would determine as, as, as an appropriate uh, number of um, conditions um, to guide that uh, recommendation. Because of the way it is now, the AP is very open. Um, yes, it, and we never contemplated being being that specific uh, through through you to you, Mr. Chair. Um, be, just I guess with the assumption that those are the things that we would be con contemplating in any event. Um, I mean, there may be situations, and I think I'm freezing even now. Um, there may well be situations where we want to accept land as, as a holding for, for potential future use, but we're not totally certain. So we would want that flexibility. But again, I don't think that we would. Um, I think it's implied the, the things that we would contemplate before accepting an, a, a land in, in lieu. So uh, certainly take those comments away and and perhaps when we um, do have our first opportunity to see what the land and loo process looks like. Maybe we would return to it, but I'm just not sure it's required because I do believe it's implied. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Secretary Treasurer Walsh? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, moving on to item 8.4, school site acquisition charge resolution process update. And back to and you, Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this uh, item is directly connected to the previous one, and we are right at the point uh, where we are ready to recommend that the board pass a school site uh, acquisition charge resolution. What we would do is pass the resolution. We would send it to uh, the relevant municipal and regional district authorities. They would have 60 days to comment. And then we would go and have the board pass a bylaw in the event that we are in good stead with our partners. Um, we have been in active conversation with our partners in all jurisdictions with respect to the school site acquisition. Um, we are very, uh, we, we believe we've been able to uh, respond to concerns by the city of Nanaimo. We believe that um, we had a positive reception from Lanceville and positive discussions with the RDN. A couple of things to note. One is that the resolution that the board is seeing in this agenda is actually going to be changed um, for the end of October. And it's going to be changed in this fashion. Uh, in the background, we note that we initially were thinking um, RDN, Area C, Lanceville, and the city of Nanaimo, and not uh, the CVRD, not Ladysmith, and not Area A. Uh, or Gabriola. We've determined, however, that based on the intention of a school site acquisition charge, that we would be better positioned to have it essentially be all of the north end of our school district. And then if we want it at a later date to proceed with the south end of the school district. So that means that area A would be included in that charge as well. The reason behind us not contemplating area A initially is that we have a closed school in that area, particularly Woodbank, um, and we don't from our um, our consultants. We are not projecting a huge amount of growth that would require additional seats. However, um, given the the guidance of the uh, ministry, we think that that consistent approach Again, splitting the district in two, north essentially, um, so a coal north oyster south would be would be looked at differently with Ladysmith uh, included. And we're still having conversations with Ladysmith about growth projections uh, and potential need or not need of a, of, of a charge. And so we would come back with the, the recommendation to put this SSAC in Nanaimo, RDN, Lanceville, uh, and then again, Gabriola, although again, Gabriola's growth numbers don't require it, certainly ND likely does. Uh, and so then the board passes the resolution. 
we send it off to our relevant partners. We would likely be open to having the relevant partners ask us to meet with with local community associations, developers, et cetera. And we've already had conversations to that effect. So we think we're ready um, to have this be new business at the board with the changed SSAC and provide uh, it in advance again for any comments to our partners. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I will uh, move on. Um, thank you, Mark. Uh, moving on to eight, item 8.5, enrollment update. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And we have Ms. Sutton who's available to jump on in the event that uh, I am going to freeze here. Um, but the highlights of uh, this year are a couple of uh, trends that we're incredibly happy to see. And that is that the consistent move away, or not away, but back from DL to our bricks and mortar schools um, has largely occurred in the way that we thought it would occur. The other big change that we've seen this year, and we're very, very happy to see it, is last year, we think largely because of the limitations of cohorts, uh, and the fact that a lot of kids could graduate in the third quarter rather than the second semester, we saw kids not taking full course loads in secondary, which brought our FTE down significantly. And so the combination of increased enrollment generally because of demographics, increased FTE at our secondaries um, is seeing a significant increase in FTE for this district. Uh, and you'll, if you see on page, I believe the number is uh, 467 additional FTE. And Tanya, uh, Ms. Sutton's going to jump in and correct me if I'm uh, not correct, uh, which is over 400 actually more than we were projecting. Uh, and, and again, largely because of that uh, secondary blip that uh, thankfully we've seen corrected. That increased FTE is driving directly driving um, more dollars, more staff uh, to our classrooms. And you'll see some of those numbers on page 36 of, of the uh, agenda. Finally, uh, we've also got more international students, which is driving an increased head, head count. So on page 37 of the agenda, we will see a significant decline in distributed learning, particularly in the K-9, which is directly related to the return uh, to uh, the classroom. The one concerning area that we do see is we do see a decline uh, in from our projections in kindergarten. So we're still up year over year in bricks and mortar, but we've seen a slight decline in the kindergarten um, section. Uh, and then the one other piece um, that I'm hoping, and it's not in the agenda, but if Ms. Matthews, if you could bring up the um, enrollment item that we discussed earlier. We'll provide this to the board so you can get a sense. Um, let's wait a moment. Maybe I could answer questions, Chair, while, um, while that item is, is being brought up. Oh, there we are. So here, sh shown on the screen right now, I think is really uh, interesting uh, information to, to contemplate. And what you're seeing is the elementary school headcount uh, over the last five years. And so what's really notable is most schools have increased from September 2020 to 21. Of course, that's related to the return to bricks and mortar. So really what we're looking at is what's the difference between pre-COVID, September 2019 and September 2021. And for the most part, our schools have not increased that significantly in the elementary context with some very notable exceptions uh, at uh, Departure Bay uh, and uh, Pleasant, no, not Pleasant Valley, Randerson is another example. And if you scroll down, Ms. Matthews, we'll also see large increases at our secondaries, uh, 
particularly at ND, uh, but Wellington as well. And every secondary, particularly from the pre-COVID year to the current year, is is increased in um, in its populations. So good news uh, there. We're a growing school district, both both because of the rebound from COVID, but also because of the demographic realities. And so Ms. Matthews, if you could stop sharing now so we can go back to seeing my initials. <laughs> and we'll, we'll share those numbers with the board uh, and we'll make them publicly available as well. Uh, but on page 38 of the agenda, you'll see the impact of what we budgeted versus where we're at. Uh, and some um, significant increased revenue due to the increased enrollment. Uh, not money that we've received yet, but we will receive it when the, the ministry does its recalculation. Uh, and we've see, again seen significant flows of staffing to, uh, to all areas of the system to support the additional enrollment. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Do we have any questions? Seeing none, I have one quick question um, through to you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. It's always great to see uh, increasing enrollment. Um, and uh, one question I had, however, was in response to the significant decrease at um, DL. Um, can you talk at all about the staffing implications there? Sure, so through you to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, last year we staffed um, DL significantly and we added uh, throughout the year almost up to the very very end because the numbers were so significant um, to try to prevent um, unreasonable course uh, counts for, for uh, teachers. But what we did was is when we budgeted uh, in spring anticipating that we were going to have a rebound to bricks and mortar that staffing pulled was pulled out as well. So it was temporary staffing and we just wasn't put back in in the budgeting process. So essentially we 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 staffed to what a non COVID year would be. This year at DL we're still a little lower on the secondary side and so we might even be a little overstaffed at this point. That'll probably come out um, as kids continue to cross enroll. One area that we ended up still though, however, not having enough staff was at the elementary level. So the K to nines, or sorry, the, the K to sevens, actually just the K to sevens, um, didn't have enough and we added extra staffing um, because we budgeted a little too little on the elementary uh, level of, at ICE. So we added three FTE uh, in addition to the SST that was funded from the board surplus. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Uh, so I don't see any other questions, so we can move on to item 8.6, child care spaces. Over to you, Mr. Walsh. Great, thank you very much. And Mr. Sabo is here to answer any questions, but we are again seeking the board's support uh, for applying to MCFD uh, to expand child care uh, at opportunities on our sites. So. A couple of things that are important to note is trustees will drive around the district and realize that actually none of our spots are yet open from the first round of uh, applications. Uh, I want to take a moment to recognize our amazing uh, crews that are out there building uh, using in-house staff. Uh, we've got a new foreman, we've got capital crews, we're, we're ready to go, uh, uh, change gears because of the cost of purchasing externally was uh, prohibitive, but of course that created delays. Uh, I also want to recognize MCFD and how flexible that they've been uh, and how committed they are to getting spaces open. So in the memo, there's five spots, Forest Park, Chase River, Ladysmith, Rock City and QQS. They are all proceeding, or at least Forest Park is almost finished. Chase River, another crew is on site. Lady Smith, they're getting going. QQS is in design stage. So what we're looking for is support to apply for another five, but the caveat is, is that the Ministry of Children and Families doesn't want to fund spots that are going to be eight years away, as an example. I'm not suggesting anyone will be that long. But what we'll do is if the board provides us support and we're seeking the support now because there's a limited time frame to make the application, 
is that we would put together up to five more spots. And if we thought that, say, three of those out of those five would be four or five years away, we're not going to apply for them. If we think they're, you know, in a reasonable time, we will. We're just looking for the ability to continue the program. Uh, and by continuing the program, we can hire more carpenters, more electricians uh, to keep that program running uh, consistently for the next three years. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Uh, I'm hoping that was the end. I'm that is the end. A pause there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> are there any questions for uh, for Mark? Secretary Treasurer Walsh, I should say. I'll just say thank you, uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. This is uh, great work. Um, we really need to, to see, or at least I personally support uh, more daycare facilities throughout our district and happy to hear the update and we'll, uh, more than happy to support the request to build more. So thank you for the update. Um, so we do have a uh, recommended motion and I, oh, I do see that um, I think Trustee McKay was first on our list to move the motion. So please go ahead, Trustee McKay. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to move the motion that the Business Committee recommends that the Board of Education of School District Number 68, Nanaimo Ladysmith, direct staff to apply for the Child Care BC New Spaces Fund through the Ministry of Children and Families for funding child care expansion for up to five school sites. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, I'll take uh, Trustee Higginson seconding the motion. Would you like to motivate uh, Trustee um, McKay? Good. Thank you. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yes, thank you. So I do support um, continuing on with this program. I know that there's still so much for us to sort out, but when there are dollars available to the district to access to help us build the actual capital facilities, I think that's an important step for us to take. And so the the language in the motion allows for us to go up to five school sites if we can if we can accomplish that, as uh, the Secretary Treasurer has stated. But um, if we have to be more conservative, then that would also be fine as long as we're continuing to create those spaces. I think that they're valuable uh, to everyone in our community. Um, and I especially appreciate uh, the highlight that uh, it will provide us an opportunity to continue employing um, QP workers to do this work for us. So I think that's great. And I look, hopefully uh, look forward to seeing us continue this work. Thank you, Trustee McKay. Uh, anyone else like to speak to the motion? Seeing none, I'll quickly say a few comments on the motion, um, and I also support the motion. I also think that uh, in addition to adding the much needed childcare spaces, I'm also uh, very pleased about uh, adding to the district's capacity um, by hiring and doing the work ourselves. And uh, as we all know, uh, we have a huge list of uh, capital needs in our district and hopefully there'll be a lot of work for them going forward. So I'm fully in support of the motion. Okay, so seeing no more comments, I'll call the question uh, on the motion. Is there anyone opposed to the motion? Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you, and thank you for your work, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Uh, one more item here, moving on to item number 8.7 regarding the by-election. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and if I could just briefly say, um, we have an internal committee that uh, reviews uh, our child care needs, and I do very little. And Mr. Davey and Mr. Sabo and Ms. Sutton uh, Ms. Uh, Carol, Jane Carroll uh, also assists us. Uh, a num there's a number of people on the committee doing um, excellent work in making that determination. So, Thank you to everyone involved. <laughs> um, the final item uh, this, e this evening is uh, with respect to by-election. So as uh, the board is aware, uh, Trustee Barron provided a resignation on September 27, 2021. And so the school act um, requires that the board uh, call a by-election if uh, unless there's an exception written in the school act um, and the only potential exception here would be had that resignation occurred after january 1st as it has not um, the board's requirement under the school act is to call an election and well in fact is to appoint a chief electoral officer 
ought to perform uh, uh, the duties of, of calling the election. The board has 30 days from the date of the resignation to make that appointment. And then from the date of the appointment, there's 80 days uh, in which the election, by the end of which the election must have occurred. So the other important thing for the board to note is that uh, because the board is multi-jurisdictional, we are required to run the election ourselves. So we can't call the city of Nanaimo or the city of Ladysmith, unless of course they wanted to, um, but we can't require them to perform the election for us. Uh, and so we would be running that election um, using uh, our forces, of course, contracting as needed, uh, bringing in support from people with election experience, etc. The question, of course, is, um, you know, we are, are in a pandemic. We really have less than a year where that individual might be in office. Uh, can we uh, have an exception from that? There would be nothing to prevent the board from asking the Minister of Education for an exception. However, uh, the minister would have to make the determination that they have the jurisdiction uh, to to allow uh, that exception. So uh, I just I put that there for the board's consideration. Uh, to note, if the board does um, uh, appoint a chief electoral officer, we are uh, strongly recommending that the board wait until the board meeting of the 27th to do so. Because uh, uh, that what that does is that allows that 80 day period to go into January. Uh, and mid-January, and so we wouldn't be having an election, we wouldn't be having uh, pre-voting opportunities at the holiday season, and so by waiting until the 27th, the likelihood is the election will be on the 15th. The other benefit is, is we already are aware that uh, our, our colleagues in Prince George are um, having an election, uh, we believe they anticipate the 15th as well, so there might be an opportunity to share resources, expertise, uh, among staff uh, who are preparing for that election. Uh, the costs are there. We anticipate $100,000, maybe a little bit less, could be a little bit more, but we don't uh, uh, we don't know that exact number at this time. Uh, and in the uh, memo, we do have a couple of recommended motions. We are recommending that the board, uh, if they are going to uh, appoint a chief electoral officer, that it would be I myself with the assistance of Ms. Matthews uh, and perhaps other deputies that we would <coughs> assign uh, would perform the duties of the chief electoral officer uh, that are found in the Local Government Act as well as in the School Act. So happy to answer any questions, uh, but two potential uh, motions for the board uh, to co uh, consider are there. And again, if the business committee does uh, proceed to recommend uh, the uh, appointment, we would uh, strongly suggest that uh, there is no special board meeting called in the interim uh, for that appointment, but wait until the board meeting of the 27th. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Are there any questions or comments? I see that uh, Trustee Higginson would, has a comment. Go ahead, Trustee Higginson. Trustee Higginson, would you like to go ahead? Okay, are there any others in the meantime? We'll come back to her, maybe she's having technical difficulties. Uh, Trustee McKay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this has been an interesting situation, of course, for most of us on the board to start contemplating, um, you know, sort of what we're hearing in the community and um, and around uh, the various tables where we seek input. Um, and advice. So, you know, it's been an interesting couple of weeks, of course. Um, you know, for myself, I'm not looking to see us um, ask for an exemption. I think that um, the process is laid out quite clearly in the School Act legislation, and I, and I, um, you know, I'm perfectly happy to move forward with that. I recognize that, um, you know, there is some question out there about, you know, the cost of the school district and those types of things, you know, um, with the shorter term of filling that seat. However, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, we need to recognize and, and really acknowledge publicly, probably regularly, that 
we didn't trigger this by election. Um, there was a federal election that was called, and as a result, um, you know, people put their names forward, and then you know it created a vacancy on our board. So this isn't. Um, it's not a willful spending or wasting of money, which perhaps we've heard comment of, um, but rather us following the appropriate process that's laid out for us, um, given that we are elected officials uh, and there's legislation and process there for us to follow. So I just think those are important comments to consider. Um, and I just wanted to, to state that that's, um, that's how I'm feeling about things. And at the end of the month at our regular board meeting, I look forward to appointing a chief electoral officer uh, to fulfill that seat for further community uh, connection for the board. Thank you, Trustee McKay. Um, let's try Trustee Higginson again, see if she has uh, been able to resolve her issues with her microphone. And if not, we'll go to Trustee Bursevic. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. Okay. Thank you. Apparently it was my headphones. Um, so I just wanted to comment that, um, as you know, I work with the ministry a lot in another role and I have asked the question about if there's even a legislative possibility. Um, is it worth the ask based on, you know, we had some feedback from community members in various places that talked about the, the cost of this election and the timing. So it, it does appear from the, the perspective of folks that I asked a question to, and, and if the board's wish is to continue to, you know, send in a, re a formal request, then we certainly can, but that they, they just don't see a lever that would allow um, the minister to, to, um, to give this SD68 uh, um, uh, an exemption to the election. So I just um, put that out there for my colleagues to think about in terms of the timing and the appointment of the possibility of a chief electoral officer, that it, it does not appear that there is a lever for uh, an exemption to be granted. Thank you, Trustee Higginson. Uh, so moving on to Trustee Berzovic. Thank you, Chair. I admit that I am a little disappointed in what Trustee Higginson just said. I was, I have gone back and forth on this issue since the, uh, uh, since the Trustee Barron won her election and announced her resignation. Uh, I've spoken to uh, people in the, many people in the community have come and talked to me and, and have said that they're just exhausted. It's not even the financial aspect it's the energy that it can take to meaningfully pay attention and to an election campaign, particularly in that December, January time period. Uh, so I am, uh, my instinct was to lean towards at least attempting to ask for the, uh, the uh, exemption. However, if that is not likely to be feasible, I certainly don't want to muck up the the process. You know, I I think if we need to have the by election, if we don't think we're going to get the exemption, then I guess we have to just go ahead and call it and and make that make that decision. And then the, I don't know. And the other half of me says, what's the harm in asking formally? But I also thank I you. Know. Yeah. Sorry, Trustee Bursevic, didn't mean to cut no, you off. No, no, it's it's just it's it's a it's a real conundrum to me. Yeah, and, and I I'm still not sure how I feel about it. Thank you. Um, so moving on to Mr. and I'm not going to get your name correctly. Sorry, Jeremy. Mr. Inch, Incho. Incho. Thank you. Close. Uh, and thank you. Um, Chair, um, the NUTA uh, members of the executive and uh, staff reps met last night to discuss the matter um, and uh, appreciate the cost uh, involved and the short timeline, um, but are very um, invested in the democratic processes uh, that are in place and uh, urges the board to continue with the by-election. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anyone else wishing to, um, to speak at this time? Trustee Stanley? Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I am um, not in favor of seeking an exemption. Um, just, you know, uh, I know our community is a little burnt out in elections. We're very good at them. But um, 
I do think it's important to a respect the democratic process and b have faith in our electorate to um, you know give us someone to well, that will be as good as Trustee Barron. So, um, uh, uh, cost is unfortunate, um, timing is unfortunate, but those are just realities. And and uh, so I, you know, I, I respect staff's recommendation that we wait um, to respect the community's timelines too um, for our. Um, public board meeting um, or general board meeting, but um, at this time, I, I, I am not in favor of seeking an exemption. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Oh, I s momentarily saw Trustee O'Neill, but uh, did you wish to speak, Trustee O'Neill? Popped up on my screen. No? Okay. Give you a minute here. <laughs> Go ahead, Trustee O'Neill. Sure, why not? Uh, through the chair, I just also want to echo a lot of what I've heard here, and uh, would not really, at this point in time, unless I could be con convinced strongly otherwise, that uh, reaching out for an extension would be appropriate. I too believe that this is a democratic process, and. Uh, while I know that there are many out there who begrudge having to go to the polling stations again, it's one of the things that makes uh, makes these uh, boards and uh, governance uh, processes work well. So um, that's all I had to say on that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing none. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Walsh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh, for uh, making your way through technical challenges this evening. And we will move on um, to item nine. I, we don't have any correspondence referred from the board and uh, no unfinished or new business. Nothing uh, for information. And Ms. Matthews has just advised that there are no questions at this time. So can I get a motion to adjourn? Trustee Higginson and seconded by Trustee Berzovic. Is there anyone opposed to the motion? Seeing none, uh, motion is carried and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you everyone.